The NDAA followed up with a permanent injunction and said the government was unable to define precisely what direct or substantial support means. Thus, an individual could run the risk of substantially supporting or directly supporting an associated force without even being aware that he or she was doing so. In fact, she said, when indefinite detention and possible execution are on the line, no law can be this vague. This measure has a chilling impact on First Amendment rights. Does not define these terms. Most laws you will see definition after definition after definition of a term. This means this in this case. This means this in that case. This means that. None of that is in the NDAA. So since a belligerent or terrorist act is not defined in the NDAA, we must look to our government to define it for us. Congress passes a law, they often leave some things a little bit vague so that an agency can institute that policy and decide what the policy of the law will be. So let's look at what the government defines a belligerent or a possible terrorist, suspected terrorist as. This is from the FBI and Bureau of Justice Assistance document called Communities Against Terrorism. It's a list of 30 documents they hand out to business owners and new businesses as they crop up in different communities around the country. This is who you're supposed to call the FBI and Department of Homeland Security over when you see these things. Anyone who demands identity privacy. You know, you don't want to give your social security number and your kid's birthday to the, the cashier. Insists on paying with cash. <laughs> Significantly alters their appearance from visit to visit. Has a missing hand or fingers. Chemical burns. Strange odors. So every time I walk into somebody's house and smell a strange odor, I'm supposed to call the FBI. I also ask these college students, okay, so what is a strange odor? The closest thing they came up with is onions. I don't know if that is, is accurate or not. Pretty close. Or brightly colored stains on clothing. So, you know, your kid was eating a hot dog, got a little ketchup and mustard on his white shirt. They call the FBI. If you make racist or extreme religious statements coupled with comments that are violent, or appear to condone violence. What's the problem with appearances? They're subjective. Exactly. If I say I'm going to take this podium and I throw it at the audience, you guys really don't believe I'm going to throw the podium at you. But somebody out there might hear, who's well, going to throw the podium at the audience and call the FBI? Appearance of violence. Here's my favorite. Make suspicious comments regarding anti-US anti-U.S. comment. I want my government to be constrained within constitutional bounds. Is that an anti-U.S. comment? Or saved by some. What is an anti-United States comment? Radical theology or vague or cryptic warnings that suggest or appear to endorse the use of violence in support of a cause. What's the problem with a vague or cryptic warning? It's vague or cryptic, you're not supposed to get it. Okay, so let's look, what else? What else we got? This is from the Stark Report, or the Communities Against Terrorism Report released 31 days after the NDAA was signed into law. Who do they list as suspected terrorists? Those who are nationalistic as opposed to universal international orientation. Anti-global, suspicious of centralized federal authority. Reverence of individual liberty and believe in conspiracy theories that threaten individual liberty and or national sovereignty. Since when did reverence become a crime? Since when did suspicion become a crime? Yet, those who are reverent of individual liberty are listed as the next possible terrorists. Or single issue, groups or individuals, panda, that obsessively focus on panda, sp very specific or narrowly defined panda, issues. Panda, people against the NDAA, a very specific issue, under the Department of Homeland Security report released two days after we were founded, lists us as a terrorist group. Warning signs for police. This is interesting. This was a story released in the Times Magazine, that, or Time Magazine, that <coughs> said police discuss terrorism at the White House. They brought together police chiefs from across the country and Department of Homeland Security, and they got together to discuss how to combat terrorism. The article listed these things. It was quickly taken down from the
Time Magazine website. No longer is there. However, we were able to capture this screenshot from Fox News when they reported on it. People likely to commit violence speak against the government. Speaking against the government is now a crime? They blame the government for their perceived problems. So number one, you all have no problems. Your life is perfect. Keep that in mind. All your problems are perceived. And number two, if you blame the government for those problems, you could be a suspected terrorist. Unusual or extreme actions that catch the attention of others. Active online to show extreme views, slash, connect with others. That means or. Anyone ever sent an email? Half the crowd has sent an email? Anyone ever sent an email? You're all, welcome to the terrorist club, everyone. Okay, what else? There's one last report we didn't put in here yet, but it's from a very recent report out of West Point, the West Point Center for Counterterrorism. And it lists specifically anti-federalists as possible terrorists. Anti-federalists. That's a word you don't hear very often. There's not an anti-federalist coffee meeting tomorrow. You don't see anti-federalist garage sale. <laughs> anti-federalist is a word only used when speaking about your constitutional rights. Right. Why? The anti-federalist wrote the Bill of Rights. They made sure it was in the Constitution. That's right. And when a document comes out and says anti-federalists are the new terrorists, you know who they're targeting. Us. Right. That's who they're targeting. So let's dive back into the NDAA, Section 1022. The requirement in paragraph 1 shall apply to any person whose detention is authorized under section 1021. We'll dive into that requirement in a second. We're going to talk about does it apply to American citizens, but first of all, pop quiz. Does it matter if the NDAA applies to American citizens? Yes. Yes. No. No. See, some of you knew it was a trick question. <laughs> the Bill of Rights will never once have the word citizen in it. Only the word person. You will never find the word citizen in the Bill of Rights. Why? Because to put the word citizen, or to put the word lawful resident alien, over your rights, implies that your rights are not inalienable and endowed by your creator, as the Declaration of Independence put it. It implies instead that your rights are given to you by government, and can be taken away by government by simply removing your citizenship status. However, if our rights are to be inalienable, they must be rights of people. And so it doesn't matter if the NDA applies to American citizens. If it applies to a person in the United States, it doesn't matter. That person could be you. You walk into a courtroom, the NDA only applies to persons. You walk into a courtroom, if you get one, say you walk, let's say they give you a trial. You walk into a courtroom and you say, I'm an American citizen, this should never affect me. You should never have detained me and taken me to a military camp. And they go, you're not a citizen. Yes, I am. Here's my papers. Well, what are those papers? government documents. Those are forged. What do you do? Have your rights been stripped from you by a judge? Absolutely not. It does not matter if the NDA applies to American citizens, but it still does, and here's why. So what is this requirement? In general, except as provided in paragraph 4, the armed forces of the United States, not the FBI, not the police, not your local sheriff, the armed forces of the United States shall hold a person described in paragraph 2 is captured in the course of hostilities authorized by the AUMF, paragraph 2, belligerent acts, we just read, in military custody pending disposition of the law of war. Military custody. So this is not your local officer knocking on your door with a warrant and taking a criminal to jail. This is the military taking you to a military prison. Shall hold means must hold. No ifs, no ands, no buts about it. No way around. Shall hold means they must hold you. Now, Senator Dianne Feinstein, who some of you may oh. recognize that name, introduced this amendment to the NDAA. The requirement to detain a person in military custody under this section does not extend to citizens of the United States. So it seems like everything's good now. It seems like we're all happy now. There's no, no reason to worry. It doesn't apply to American citizens. Notice how it does not say, however, these sections don't apply to American citizens. It wouldn't need to. The AUMF already covered non-citizens. It says the requirement does not extend. 
If you talk to a friend, you say, you're not required to wear a coat to that meeting. Can he? Absolutely. Removing the requirement only removes the requirement, not the option. The military still has the option to detain American citizens. Now, what does this do? This creates a two-track court system. One other country had a very notable two-track court system, and that was Nazi Germany. Now, I'm obviously a young guy, and there's a lot of internet comments go around. We have a rule on the internet called Godwin's Law, and it means that the longer a conversation goes on on the internet, the closer to 100% the chance of Hitler being mentioned is there, and you call the other person Hitler. And so we use it a lot in, in society just, just for random things. However, when you compare the actions that Hitler did in Nazi Germany to America, you'll begin to see a correlation. In Nazi Germany, they had a two-track court system. What that means is, let's take this scenario. A commander comes and tells his police sergeant, secret police sergeant, I want you to detain that person. They're spreading anti-Nazi propaganda. Who did you go detain that person? And the sergeant goes out and detains this person, takes them back in, and they're about ready to go to a military trial, but then instead the general says to the commander, um, the, the chief says to the commander, no, no, that's my friend. I know him. And so they give that person their constitutional rights to back on the street, no worries. However, if that person's a political dissenter, they bring him in, they try him under military court, and that person is then detained indefinitely and or executed. That's how a two-track court system works. And this creates a two-track court system in the United States. Here's a very simple graph. Non-citizens shall hold. U.S. citizens may hold. Now this was later modified by a presidential policy directive, so now they're both may hold, but the option still exists. Does the Constitution authorize the president to have that kind of power? No. Absolutely not. So does the NDA undermine your constitutional rights? Absolutely. Here's a short list. Article 1, Section 9, Suspension Clause. You can only suspend habeas corpus when the public safety will require it and in cases of rebellion and or invasion. Now, we're not in rebellion and or invasion yet. And the president has no authority to himself suspend habeas corpus and Congress has to suspend it in a specific bill designated to do so. They have not. They did not. They're just ignoring habeas corpus. They're not suspending it. Article 3, Section 2, Grand Jury Indictment. You are not getting a trial. You are not getting a grand jury. Article 3, Section 3, Treason. This is interesting. Who is familiar with Anwar al-Awlaki? Go people. Okay. Anwar al-Awlaki is an American citizen who is in Yemen who was assassinated with a drone strike. Extrajudicially assassinated with a drone strike. His son, Abdurrahman al-Awlaki, was assassinated two weeks later in a separate drone strike. 16 years old. Citizen from Colorado. Now, the United States government accused Amr al waki through the media, of being a traitor. Of committing treason against the United States. However, there is only one crime defined in our Constitution. One. And there's only one crime that the bar is set for what makes a person guilty in our Constitution, and that is treason. Because the British government used to take the Founding Fathers in and say, you, you committed treason. Nathan Hale, 21 years old, was brought in by the British government and hung on treason. This is why the treason clause was put in there, so that the United States government did not have the right to kill, as it's called, and just call someone a traitor, and that be instant law. 